And now we are going to review the Russian Revolution period. Grigory Kotovsky. Almost all of those who had been born under the Soviet rule probably had seen the movie Timur and his team, which was filmed in early 30s. And there it was said that an hour before his execution, Kotovsky was torturing his body with the Japanese gymnastics. Well, it was the Indian one. Kotovsky practiced yoga. I regret I don't have this picture of his in asanas, which I saw in Lenin Museum in Russia. In that museum, on the Red Square in Moscow, there was his notebook with yogic practices. Well, and if someone practices something an hour before his execution, that means that it is not just a physical practice, but it also has a spiritual and mystical element. Although Kotovsky was not executed, this is quite an interesting moment. And here we see two pictures of the founders of one of the most mystical secret societies in the USSR, Gleb Boki and Alexander Barchenko. These are their jail photos. Gleb Boki was appointed by Lenin as a head of a very special committee of the Communist Party. Actually, this committee had two purposes – to study occult phenomena and to gather compromising information about all the party's heads. This was the man who frightened even Stalin. Well, while well, Stalin could have been frightened of him. In 1937, Boki was surely executed. But before this, Boki, together with Alexander Barchenko, whom he considered to be his teacher, had created the People's Labor Union, a society which had its aim to study occult phenomena. It also had a purpose to establish connections with the East, intelligence service in the East, experiments with human psyche and experiments with mass consciousness. So in 1937 Boki was arrested. And he was shot almost in that very day when he was arrested because he had compromising information almost of all of the Communist Party leaders of that time, including Stalin himself. Boki was the true ascetic. Despite his huge power and huge influence, all his life he had lived in a small flat and dealt only with what he was interested in. He had lots of practice. As for Barchenko, this was the man who tried to arrange the Soviet expeditions for searching of Shambhala. And what's for yoga in the Stalin period, we can notice Tatyana Okunevskaya, the famous actress, the woman of People's Commissars Yezhov and Beria, well, I don't remember which one exactly, but this was not an obstacle for her to get to the concentration camps. She was considered to be the sex symbol of Russia. Well, not all sex symbols have a good fortune. Much later, in her older memories, she wrote, While being in jail there, I survived only because of carrot and yoga. She mentioned carrot because she was a raw foodist and yoga because she actually practiced yoga. So we see that tradition wasn't interrupted even in such a dark times. Another interesting person, whom Solzhenitsyn had described in his Archipelago Gulag, although he changed his name, was Dmitry Panin, who all this time in the camps practiced yoga, Hatha Yoga in particular. And again, thanks to this, he managed to survive. About this you can read Solzhenitsyn. But not everybody was imprisoned. Mikhail Chekhov, the nephew of Anton Pavlovich Chekhov and the student of Stanislavsky, the author of On the Technique of Acting. Well, actually the Stanislavsky acting system is literally borrowed from the system of Steiner, the anthroposophical theater. The first book of Stanislavsky was called Theatrical System of Steiner because it has lots of techniques working with energy, with energy of the auditory, techniques which he called radiating and absorbing, which is radiation and absorption of chakral energies. But Soviet authorities had hinted Stanislavski that anthroposophy is not our way, we need our own revolutionary system. Stanislavski was a wise man, considering the fact that he had lived a long and happy life, even with such rulers, and he rebranded the Steiner system to the Stanislavsky system, the progressive and proletarian as we know it now. 
Of course, the system remained purely energetical and anthroposophical. Mikhail Chekhov was his student, and he had practiced not only anthroposophy, but also yoga. And in his memories, in the technique of acting, he writes, The philosophy of yoga was perceived by me quite objectively, without hope for a new world outlook, but without a slightest internal resistance. And of course, if we are talking about yoga in Stalin period, we must mention the academic Boris Leonidovich Smirnov. He was an academician specializing in surgery, in medicine, not the Eastern studies, we must say. But in his childhood, on some marketplace, definitely because of some karmic predispositions, he had bought the handbook on Sanskrit, probably the one of Müller's, the pre-revolutionary, and Smirnov himself was around 10 years then, and he was very fascinated with this. Without Hazel, he had learned Sanskrit, and then, when he became the hugely famous surgeon, surely he was exiled, as any other good man of that times. There, he had started the translation of Mahabharata. His Russian translation of Mahabharata is still most complete and, as for me, most inspiring, most poetic. He even managed to publish Mahabharata during his lifetime in some Ashgabat publishing called Ilim with the capital U. I can consider that on this translation the next generation of Soviet yogis and Soviet mysticists had grown. In this translation he managed to include a huge part, as I remember, in Narayaniya, a separate chapter which was called Sankhya Yoga, which actually was the textbook on yoga. From one side Smirnov gave a very detailed description of history of yoga and his own side, and from the other he described the particular exercises, and those are described very carefully and correctly. And being a physician, he also described the physiological mechanisms of asana influence and pranayama influence upon human. This book is actual even now, and I think it's interesting for any practitioner. Also, he was quite interesting and original oriental scholar, albeit self-taught. In previous part of my lecture, I already quoted him concerning his theory on Brahmanical and Kshatriya controversy in India as an explanation of Brahmanical and Kshatriya styles of yoga. According to his biography, he was a very bright and inquisitive person, and obviously a deep practitioner. Where from had he taken his exercises is not quite clear, but as for me, it's most close to the Shivananda yoga style, closer than to any other contemporary 